In late 1998, the Australian Prime Minister, John Howard, wrote a letter to the President of Indonesia, BJ Habibi, making the case for a period of autonomy and, eventually, an independence referendum for the small Indonesian province of East Timor. East Timor was originally a Portuguese, rather than a Dutch colony, and thus has a very different culture and identity to the rest of Indonesia. In response to this letter, the Indonesian president called for a snap independence referendum to be held in mid-1999. The impact of this chain of events was disastrous for the people of East Timor. Pro-Indonesian militias, many of which had plantations in the province, quickly began roaming the streets of Dili, randomly killing and terrorizing the population. The Indonesian military was, at the very least, not taking active measures to stop the violence, and there were good indications that the local militias were actively being supported by them. In response to the breakdown of law and order, John Howard proposed that an Australian-led UN peacekeeping mission be launched to quell the violence. This proposal quickly gained support from the UN Secretary General and the US President. On the 15th of September 1999, Resolution 1264 passed the UN Security Council unanimously, and within a week, Australian and international forces were on the ground in East Timor. The nucleus of the Interfet military force was the 5,500-strong ADF deployment, which centred on the 3rd Brigade and a Special Forces Detachment. In total, 28 nations supported the Interfet mission, which peaked at over 11,000 men. When faced with the international military forces which now confronted them, the local militias fled to West Timor, although some small-scale combat occurred. The Australian contribution to Interfet was a great success, as the now independent nation of Timor Leste demonstrates. However, the operation showed huge gaps in the ADF's capability. Although the deployment of a brigade group to East Timor was quite a large deployment from a historical perspective, Dili is extremely close to Australian bases and the port of Darwin. Even considering this extremely close proximity, the ADF struggled to deploy and sustain its forces. In 1999, the ADF's meagre amphibious force consisted of the two very old 8,000-ton Canimbla-class LPAs, or Landing Platform Amphibious, and the 3,300-ton landing ship heavy HMAS Tobruk. A 12,000-ton converted passenger ferry, HMAS Jervis Bay, was also brought into service. Interfet was a strategic shock for Australia. The government now faced the prospect that the ADF may be called upon to deploy a brigade within the region again, but next time at a far greater distance than East Timor. Australia's region is a vast area of maritime geography, filled with numerous developing nations that may require military intervention. The stark reality was, if Canberra was called upon to commence a comparable operation elsewhere in the region, in say Fiji or the Marshall Islands, it may well be beyond the ADF's capability. It was in the wake of this strategic shock that Australia took the first steps on the road to a fully functional, blue water amphibious capability, comparable to the most advanced navies in the world. The first capability shortfall was obviously the RAN's amphibious warfare vessels. The aged Canimbla class and HMAS Tobruk were neither large enough to move the required material, nor did they have the aviation capacity to allow amphibious operations in a truly hostile environment. The decision was taken to replace the two Canimblers with much larger vessels, upgrading from an LPA to an LHD. The final design chosen was the 27,000 ton Canberra class landing helicopter dock. Based on the Spanish Juan Carlos I LHD, the Canberras are the largest ships ever operated by the Royal Australian Navy, being substantially larger than the Majestic class carriers HMAS Sydney and HMAS Melbourne. The selection of the Canberra class was a quantum leap in capability. HMS Canberra by herself has a higher displacement and a far greater amphibious capability than HMAS Canimbla, Manura, Tobruk and Jervis Bay combined. The two Canberra class LHDs are highly capable amphibious warfare vessels with large scale aviation and vehicle capacities. The flight deck is 4,750 metres squared and is equipped with a 13 degree ski jump to facilitate the use of Stovall aircraft, such as the AV-8B Harrier and, theoretically, the F-35B. There are six landing spots on the deck for simultaneous helicopter operations. Below the flight deck is the combined hangar and light vehicle deck. The hangar is 990 square meters and can accommodate eight medium-sized helicopters, although up to 18 aircraft can be accommodated if the 1880 meter squared light vehicle deck is also used as hangar space. 
below the hangar and light vehicle deck is the heavy vehicle deck, which is some 1,410 metres squared. Combined across both decks, the Canberra can carry some 110 vehicles and 8 helicopters, not including flight deck space. She has accommodation facilities for over 1,000 embarked personnel, including aircrew. At the rear of the ship is a large well deck which has space for four landing craft medium, or LCM, each one of which can deliver an M1 Abrams main battle tank. In summation, a single Canberra class LHD can accommodate a mechanised infantry battalion and put it ashore quickly and efficiently. HMAS Canberra and HMAS Adelaide were both delivered to the RAN by 2015. In 2011, the RAN was able to acquire the almost brand new landing ship dock, HMAS Chules, the former Royal Fleet Auxiliary Largs Bay. Chules is a 16,000 ton LSD, which is equipped with a large well deck and can support two LCMs. She has a large flight deck, but no dedicated hangar space, and can support simultaneous helicopter and landing craft operations. Chules has accommodation facilities for 350 embarked personnel, and has 1,150 metres of linear vehicle space. Combined with the two Canberra class LHDs, HMAS Chules rounds out an impressive set of amphibious warfare vessels, providing standard accommodation for 2,300 men, around 300 vehicles and 16 helicopters, without utilising overload capacity or deck parking for aircraft. Ships, however, are only one element of an effective amphibious capability. Excellent amphibious warfare vessels are useless if the men and material they are designed to deploy are not fit for purpose. In line with the reform program under Plan Beersheba, the Australian Army has undertaken a sustained program to generate an effective amphibious force, which has been an extremely difficult task for an organisation with very limited amphibious experience. Nonetheless, tremendous advances have been made. The first step on this path was the reorganisation of the 2nd Battalion, Royal Australian Regiment. 2RAR is now the Army's Specialised Amphibious Warfare Battalion and has been transferred from 3rd Brigade to the Direct Command of Headquarters, 1st Division. 2RAR has been completely retasked and restructured to operate as the Army's dedicated pre-landing and amphibious raiding force. The battalion is no longer structured in the same manner as the Army's other infantry battalions, but is optimised around maritime reconnaissance, akin to a USMC recon battalion. It is now constituted by two company-sized combat teams, called a pre-landing force, PLF-A and PLF-B. Each PLF contains a company headquarters, an infantry platoon, a recon and sniper platoon, and a small boat platoon. Each PLF company group is habitually reinforced with clearance diver, light electronic warfare, unmanned aerial surveillance, and an engineer recon elements from units such as the 7th Signals Regiment and 20th Surveillance and Target Acquisition Regiment. It is truly a joint force. 2RAR's role is both adaptable and scalable. When only one amphibious ship is deployed, a PLF acts as a ready raiding force that can quickly and covertly be inserted into hostile shorelines by air or sea to gain intelligence or take hostile action. However, when the whole amphibious force is deployed for large-scale operations, 2RAR's role is critical. The PLF will covertly insert elements to provide intelligence and then secure landing beaches and helicopter landing zones. Once the main force is ashore, the PLF can remain, providing the battle group commander with a dedicated recon company. 2RAR is the key to achieving effective ADF amphibious operations, and in the last decade has achieved a remarkable level of proficiency. 2RAR is only the first element in generating land forces which are truly capable at amphibious operations. With 2RAR as the Amphibious Recon Battalion, the ADF has moved to a rotational model for a ready amphibious battalion. This battalion, called the Ground Combat Element, is simply composed of one of the Australian Army's ready battle groups. Under Plan Beersheba, the Army's three brigades were restructured into multi-role combat brigades, composed of two infantry battalions, an armoured cavalry regiment, an artillery regiment, a combat engineer regiment, a combat support battalion, and a combat signals regiment. Each of these brigades can form two battle groups centred on each infantry battalion. At any one time, each brigade is undergoing a 12-month phase, either a reset phase of individual training, a readying phase where the brigade is preparing for combat operations, or a ready phase where they are certified for deployment. During each ready phase, one of the brigade's battle groups is designated as the amphibious ground combat element 
and must be prepared to deploy forces, either at a company or battalion strength, where required. During this phase, the ground combat element undergoes specific amphibious training. By using a rotational method, the whole army will eventually gain amphibious experience. In 2018, the GCE was formed by 8-9 RAR. In 2019, it was 7 RAR, and this year it is 3 RAR. With 2 RAR and the rotational ground combat element structure now in place, the ADF has developed a three-tiered amphibious structure called the Amphibious Task Group. The three sizes of the task group are the amphibious ready element, the amphibious ready unit, and the amphibious ready group. The smallest force, the amphibious ready element, is composed of one amphibious ship, one pre-landing force combat team from two RAR, one company strength combined arms combat team from the ground combat element battalion, a troop of four Taipan multi-role helicopters or MHH, and a logistics team. A typical combat team is an infantry company reinforced with artillery, engineer, cavalry, and other elements. The whole force is equivalent to an understrength battalion. Two of these amphibious ready elements can be deployed simultaneously in different theaters. The next size up, the amphibious ready unit, is comprised of two amphibious ships, a PLF from two RAR, a battle group headquarters, two company strength combined arms combat teams, a Tiger Attack Helicopter Troop, an MRH Troop, and a Chinhook Heavy Lift Helicopter Troop. A helicopter troop is typically between four and six helicopters. This formation is equivalent to a battalion. The largest amphibious force is called the Amphibious Ready Group. The ARG is composed of all three amphibious ships, both PLF combat teams from two RAR, a battle group headquarters, four combat teams from the ground combat element, a Tiger Attack Helo Squadron, an MRH Squadron, and a Chinook Squadron. This battle group is equivalent to an understrength brigade, with an infantry battalion, recon battalion, armoured cavalry squadrons, artillery batteries, air defence batteries, and engineer companies. The third major area which is necessary for the effective employment of amphibious forces is doctrine, or more specifically, the specific concept of operations which will guide the employment of the force. This is also an area in which the ADF has made great strides. Detailed planning for an amphibious assault is conducted using the PERMSAT model. Planning, embarkation, rehearsal, movement to the area of amphibious action, shaping the action area, especially ashore, to the amphibious action, and termination. This leads to a seven-step doctrinal concept for the employment of Australia's amphibious force. Step one shape the area by conducting advanced force operations. This includes eliminating potential threats with long-range strike and special forces insertions. This could include reducing the potential land-based anti-ship missile threat or striking enemy command and control, for example. Step two, establish sea and air control. This would require the deployment of a maritime task group centered on a Hobart-class destroyer, in addition to a number of Anzac-class frigates and a Collins-class submarine, if the threat required that level of deployment. It may also require the deployment of RAAF assets, such as fighters. Step 3. Maneuver the amphibious force to the area of amphibious action. Step 4. Conduct pre-landing force operations, internal to the amphibious task group. This includes covert reconnaissance by the PLF, and the seizure of landing beaches and helicopter landing zones. Step five, undertake amphibious action. Lodge the force to achieve the assigned mission. Once the beach and helicopter landing zones have been secured by the PLF, the main components of the ground combat element can be deployed. With the ARG's helicopter assets, the battle group commander can deploy a whole company strength combat teams by single helicopter lift. And the landing craft are capable of landing M1 Abrams main battle tanks in the first wave. Depending on the conditions, the whole battle group can be deployed in a matter of hours rather than days. Step six, deploy follow-on forces as required, strategic lift by air and sea. Once the ground combat element is safely ashore and a beachhead has been established, conditions for follow-on forces must be met. If no airfield has been captured, one can be rapidly constructed. In 2007, as part of the Joint Rapid Air Base Construction or JRAC program, a joint US and Australian team of engineers constructed a C-17 capable airstrip in 16 days, only using on-site materials and a small number of engineering vehicles, around 25. Once an airfield has been acquired, the rest of the ready brigade can begin to be deployed, 
with the Brigade HQ and the other Ready Battle Group. The RAAF strategic airlift capacity has been substantially increased over the past two decades, with the acquisition of eight C-17 Globemaster heavy lift strategic transports, supported by a fleet of 12 C-130J Hercules and 10 C-27J Spartan tactical transports. With the acquisition of port facilities, a second brigade and the deployable Joint Force HQ can also be deployed if required, bringing the force up to divisional strength, although this would probably require commercial shipping. Step 7. Reconstitution. Once the mission has been achieved, reconstitute the force on board the amphibious ships and return to Australia. These ships, forces and concepts were put to the test in two key exercises. The first was Exercise Sea Raider 2019. In this operation, the ADF tested a unilateral Australian action with an amphibious ready unit composed of HMAS Canberra and HMAS Adelaide, rapidly deploying a battle group HQ and a mechanised combat team, including night insertion by helicopter. Sea Raider certified Australia's ability to successfully deploy combined arms amphibious forces unilaterally and without allied assistance. The whole amphibious ready group was deployed in Exercise Talisman Sabre 2019, with a brigade level exercise conducted with the United States Marine Corps. Alongside the WASP Expeditionary Strike Group, with the 31st Marine Expeditionary Unit embarked, and the USS Ronald Reagan Carrier Strike Group, the ADF deployed the amphibious ready group with the 7 RAR Battle Group. Two RAR commanded and controlled a multinational joint pre-landing force battle group. The group was composed of Australian Army personnel, United States Marines, Royal Marine Commandos, as well as Royal Australian Navy Expeditionary Reconnaissance and Clearance, and deployable geospatial and survey teams, and a Royal New Zealand Navy Rapid Environmental Assessment Team. Talisman Sabre 2019 displayed a truly formidable allied amphibious force with a brigade level operation in a simulated high threat, high intensity environment. In these exercises, the ADF demonstrated seamless integration with the United States Marine Corps, displaying a level of competence in amphibious warfare comparable to what is, arguably, the gold standard, the USMC. The story of Australia's ambitions for a real, credible amphibious warfare capability is one of rapid development and incredible achievement. In 1999, the ADF struggled to deploy its forces in its own backyard into what was a very low threat environment in East Timor. Just 20 years later, at Talisman Sabre 2019, it demonstrated a truly blue water amphibious capability, equivalent to a United States Navy Expeditionary Strike Group. That is, indeed, quite a feat. Australia's amphibious capability may be small compared to the United States, but there are very few nations which even possess the capability Australia has achieved. Russia, for example, does not possess anything comparable, and China is only now starting its own journey to develop such a capability with the Type 75 LHDs, which are still under construction. It is a quantum leap in Australia's ability to project force far beyond its shores, and may indeed be a critical asset in the advent of a high-intensity conflict in the Indo-Pacific. However, as impressive as the ADF's amphibious warfare capacity is, it is still lacking in some key areas. As Australian doctrine describes, achieving sea and air control is a key prerequisite for successfully employing the amphibious force. However, Without having the requisite naval aviation, specifically fixed-wing fighters, achieving air control especially may be reliant upon land-based RAAF assets in any situation where Australia is either acting unilaterally or when an ally cannot provide air cover. This limits the force's utility to areas where this prerequisite can be met, specifically within practical range of a friendly airbase. Obviously, for the ADF's formidable amphibious capacity to reach its true blue water potential, the ADF would need to provide its own air power from the sea. Utilising fast jets on board RAN vessels is still a touchy subject in the Australian strategic community, and currently there are no plans to invest in either a dedicated carrier or the F-35B. Certainly, to do so would require a substantial investment. However, the lack of organic fighter cover is, undeniably, the only major weakness in what is, now, a world-class amphibious capability.